Hi, everyone. Oh, thank you for coming out. Wow, it's uh, filled the room. That's great. Uh, awesome introduction. Thank you. Uh, that saved me some time. Um, so you can see right there on the screen my affiliations. I have my own website, Liberty Life Trail. Um, I started the podcast, uh, Crypto Scam. I own the domain as well uh, and the iTunes podcast. I've been too busy to make more episodes. Everyone's been asking me for it, so the episodes will come back. Uh, so that podcast takes a token or an idea or a concept and just explores it from a skeptical perspective with another expert in it. Uh, so the last episode I did was about Ethereum. The first episode I did was about Bitcoin. I sat down with someone else and we're like, hey, is Bitcoin a scam? Um, are, we all, uh, are we missing something? Uh, just a skeptical look at some of these ideas. And you can also find me on the World Crypto Network. Uh, we do a morning news show there every morning. Well, when we're in the US, it's US morning. When we're in Europe, it's been Europe morning, uh, along with other shows and other content creators. I'm very active on Twitter. You can find me as Tone Vase. Uh, but I do want to jump right into the presentation. There we go. Um, and what you see behind me is the full uh, history, the, pr the full price history of Bitcoin, uh, starting from the early days up to about a month or two ago, though ironically, we're, maybe a month ago, ironically, we're at exactly the same price that I have it up there, and we'll get to that in a second. But I like starting these presentations before uh, Bitcoin. Well, let's go back to the early days of the internet. Let's go to 1998. And uh, in 1998, uh, Paul Krugman was asked by a magazine uh, what he thought about the future of the internet. And he tried to back away from these comments and he said he was half kidding. Uh, but he clearly stated that he didn't really see the internet amounting to much. And by 2005, he expected uh, the influence of the internet to be not much different than a fax machine. Uh, this was said in 1998. Um, another Nobel Prize winning economist had something very different to say in 1999. So let's go ahead and have a listen to Milton Friedman. One of the major forces for reducing the role of government. And the one thing that's missing, but that will soon be developed, is a reliable e-cash a method whereby on the internet you can transfer funds from A to B without A knowing B or B knowing A. The way in which I can take a $20 bill and hand it over to you, and there's no record of where it came from. And you, you may get that without knowing who I am. And that kind of thing will develop on the internet, and that will make it even easier for people to use the internet. Of course, it has its negative side. It means that... Uh, the gangsters, the people who are engaged in illegal transactions will also have an easier way to carry on their business. All right, so that's what Milton Friedman had to say about the Internet, but he viewed it as you will need the Internet um, in order to reduce the role of government because he felt that without the cash component on the Internet, it was never going to achieve its full potential. Uh, Milton Friedman passed away in 2006, and uh, Satoshi uh, the, uh, mined the first Genesis block uh, in January of 2009 after publishing the white paper in 2008. Um, and that's really the difference. And when Bitcoin first came into existence, you can see it right there, we're already in 2010, and it's still worth about 10 cents. Uh, it was just a hobby. It was an interesting project. Uh, some hackers were using it to just send to each other. A lot of Bitcoins were lost that way. And then towards the end of 2010, uh, Bitcoin gained some notoriety as it started to rise towards 50 cents uh, and above. So what happened at the end of 2010? And uh, later today, I believe you will be hearing from Amir Taki. And uh, in December of 2010, when WikiLeaks was removed from being able to uh, fund itself with donations from MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, uh, they almost had to shut down their servers because they had no more donation money. Amir Taki suggested that they should use Bitcoin. Uh, he just said, bring it on, let, let, let them use Bitcoin. And Satoshi replied saying, no, 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 let's not bring it on. It's too early. The technology is still very young and we may not want this kind of attention. So 
uh, WikiLeaks initially listened, and they did not adopt Bitcoin in 2010. And now we're moving on to 2011. In 2011, the price started to rise uh, pretty quickly from about $1 all the way to $30. And at, towards the end of this monster run in Bitcoin, it was greatly helped out of my home state of New York um, and our Senator Chuck Schumer. Um, if you can uh, look really closely at that monitor in the upper le left hand corner, I know it's a little blurry, uh, but it says Silk Road. So he apparently uh, was informed about Silk Road. So he went on television for about a couple of minutes. Uh, I mean, this is a 30 four minute, 34 second video. I can't play it because I wasn't able to embed this into my presentation. But um, you can Google for this video. And this is basically a one minute tutorial on what is Silk Road, how to access Silk Road. Oh, you need to use Tor. And how do you pay for all these drugs to get delivered in the mail? Well, you have to use Bitcoin. So it was a better tutorial than I could probably do in 60 seconds on the usefulness of Bitcoin. And it greatly helped fuel uh, this bubble um, up to $30 up there in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, and that's still today the biggest bubble uh, Bitcoin ever had. It made it all the way up to 30 and, uh, and then it crashed down to $2 for a 98% uh, price correction. On the very back end of that, right after the $30 peak, that's when WikiLeaks also started accepting it uh, for donations. Things were generally quiet in 2012. Uh, oops, jumped ahead a little bit. Things were generally quiet in 2012 uh, other than China. Uh, so China, the exchanges and started coming into China. Prior to that, uh, there were some U.S. exchanges that were starting to get shut down towards the end of 2012. Um, and China um, featured Bitcoin on CCTV, uh, which is watched by over 500 million Chinese, uh, a larger number than the entire population of all of the United States. And uh, that helped fuel Bitcoin for another bubble to 1350, followed by an immediate 50% correction. So as you can see, Bitcoin has always had these um, bubbles. 2013 was probably the most interesting year for Bitcoin other than the current year. So several things happened in 2013, some of which we now know in hindsight. So in hindsight, we know that in early 2013, Mt. Gox, the biggest exchange, activated Willybot, which had fake trading that um, supposedly drove the price of Bitcoin higher. It still puzzles me why they would do it, because Mt. Gox was always running a fractional reserve. Uh, not only were they hacked in 2011 for a lot of Bitcoin, um, when Mt. Gox was bought, uh, by Mark Arpelis. Mark Arpelis did not create Mt. Gox. He bought Mt. Gox. And when he bought it, the person he bought it from, uh, he then discovered that there was 80,000 Bitcoin missing. And there are emails going back and forth between them where uh, Jeb McCaleb, the one that sold it to him, is basically telling him, oh, it's only 84,000 84 Bitcoin. 84, Bitcoin. Uh, it's only worth about $60,000. You can just mine it or just go and buy it. Uh, you couldn't really buy that kind of Bitcoin at the time. And within a few months, it wasn't 60000 anymore. It was now upwards of $10 million, uh, which Mark Arpelis clearly did not have. Um, but uh, the bigger event of 2013 happened in March, uh, right here in Europe. And this is the event that really made me take notice of Bitcoin. And more specifically, it happened in Cyprus. Uh, how many of you remember the banking shutdown of Cyprus? Excellent. Um, well, not for them. But um, so the bank shut down like they always do over the weekend. And on Monday, you have a bank holiday. Uh, the initial articles said that they were going to tax or confiscate uh, about, what, 5%, uh, 6.75% from everyone. But over 100 balances, over 100,000 euros were going to get taxed at 10%. Um, the final verdict is that all money 
beyond ten thousand dollar ten thousand euros in an account uh, ended up being taxed at forty seven and a half percent rate. Now that made me take notice uh, being again being a Wall Street analyst. Uh, I'm like, whoa, I mean, this can happen here. This can happen in any first world country. How can you protect uh, something of value that you own? And then that's when I started looking at Bitcoin more seriously. I had heard about Bitcoin because of the WikiLeaks situation uh, back in 2011 and the debates over WikiLeaks because I was a supporter of WikiLeaks at the time. Uh, the Silk Road case never interested me personally. Uh, sometimes I wish I did some drugs. Maybe I would have gotten into Bitcoin way early. Could be a lot richer today. Um, but that wasn't my path. Uh, but I finally, uh, around this time, is when me, the trader, the expert, is um, buying my Bitcoin on a bubble to 250 and then watching my Bitcoin position uh, crash in value by 75%. Um, but the difference is I knew why I was buying it. I wasn't buying it as a speculative vehicle. I was buying it to protect uh, something of value. Uh, and this is important. And my number one use case for Bitcoin uh, is not buying a cup of coffee. Uh, my number one use case for Bitcoin is for the first time in human history, you can own something of value that is unconfiscatable. Uh, if you properly protect your private key, and you're the only one that knows your private key, and you memorize that private key, uh, no one knows you have something of value, and therefore they cannot confiscate it. They can't find it with a metal detector. There, there's really not nothing anybody can do. Uh, my second most important property is that it's censorship resistant, uh, in that you can send a Bitcoin to anyone in the world, uh, not instantly, but fast enough, not anonymously, but anonymously enough uh, if you take some precautions. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's so much better than anything else we have for those two purposes, and those two will always be my priorities. Um, so after it falls from the bubble to 250, oh, and I remember like uh, talking to some of the PhDs and some of the other very like smart people I work with, and I'm like worrying that, hey, you know, that's a you, that's Europe. I mean, that can happen here. And they're all laughing at me like, no, that can't happen here. That's just Cyprus. You know, that can never happen in America. Um, that they can never shut down the banks and then take away half your money. Uh, but I clearly think that's still very likely to happen. Um, so we go through the rest of 2013, uh, not very eventful. People still, you know, a lot of people bought on that bubble, you know, sitting on losses. Something interesting happened right there. You have that little dip to $85. That happened on October 1st. Uh, so um, that day, anybody remember what happened October 1st, 2013? Silk Road. Uh, that's the day the government shut down Silk Road. Uh, it was a, uh, the price fell from 120 down to 85 in one day. Uh, so that's like a 40% correction um, in one day. And uh, I remember one of my coworkers like runs up to my desk that morning when I got to work and is like laughing at me. And he goes, ha ha, Silk Road got shut down. What are you going to do with your Bitcoin now? And because pretty much everyone at the office was somewhat making fun of me for, because when you get into Bitcoin, you just can't shut up about it, right? So you just have to tell everyone. And, um, and uh, so everyone knew. And, uh, but um, I mean, they were joking. They knew I was, uh, that that wasn't really my thing. But immediately we recovered and started to go up. Uh, now that way up, um, I don't have a picture of it, but it, gr it was greatly helped by the Senate hearings uh, in the U.S. in that um, the U.S. Congress seemed to be looking at Bitcoin kind of open-minded. Uh, so that helped fuel that, plus the Mt. Gox situation with Willybot. Uh, plus the exchanges. I mean, the Japanese exchange is about to go broke. The U.S. exchanges are shutting down. You know, Charlie Shrem gets arrested for bid instant. Uh, Trade Hill and some of the other U.S. exchanges get shut down. Kind of what's happening in China a little bit now. Um, China might shut down Bitcoin exchanges. It might not. No one really knows. But U.S. has gone through that, and Bitcoin did just fine. And um, But yeah, China is starting to take over all the volume. So going up is easy. What happens on the way down? Um, oops, skipped one slide. Um, skipped a couple of slides, actually. 
Uh, there we go. So what happens on the way down? Um, and everyone thought Bitcoin would go up forever. And the moment everyone thinks it's going to go up forever, you have a bubble. Okay. So bubbles pop in uh, a very predictable manner every time. Uh, the question is, uh, after the first new paradigm top and you go to return to normal, you don't know if you're going to have to keep going up. So uh, bubbles are always obvious in hindsight. They're not very obvious when they're happening. And anyone who thought that the dot-com bubble was a bubble in 1999 could have made 20, 30 percent on the entire stock market in one year from 1999 to 2000. Okay, so they're very hard to predict in real time. Uh, but this is the typical bubble chart. And if I ask people, you know, hey, where, where is Bitcoin on this chart? And I've been asking that question with this presentation uh, for two years. This might actually be one of the last times I'm doing this presentation. I'm going to switch it up. Um, I've, I've done this enough. Most people saw it. It's going to be on the internet again. And uh, starting next year, I am going to talk about how the ICO bubble is comparable to the dot-com bubble uh, that, we were, uh, that we had 20 years ago. But when I was asking this question, even a few years ago, somebody yelled out from the audience, well, we're all the way on the left. You haven't even seen this yet. And I kind of agree with it. I actually don't think we hit the mania phase yet. So I think Bitcoin still has a lot to go. But on a shorter term time frame, you have an asset in the background, and that asset is silver. And it's not that they're the same price. Uh, Bitcoin is in blue, and it's linear. Uh, this chart is cut off in early 2017 because Bitcoin went up too high, and it skews the scale. Um, but uh, Bitcoin was moving much faster. But I have lined up these arrows and the yellow circle to the yellow circle, red circle to the red circle. It fell in, a, in an identical pattern to silver. Uh, the way silver was falling from 50 down to 10 bucks over a three-year span, uh, Bitcoin did the same thing in about a year. Uh, so it was just faster, but the way it fell was just so identical. I had to put this uh, chart together and I tweeted it out. And I don't recall if I wrote a specific article about it or not. Um, so here's Bitcoin on the way down. And several things were happening on the way down. Um, I guess my that equal sign is cut off a little bit. But that says, you know, we all know uh, that price is equals supply versus demand. But in Bitcoin, it's a little bit different, right? Because Bitcoin is still inflationary kind of on a decaying scale. But that's predictable. We know how much Bitcoin is going to be mined, uh, more or less. So uh, Bitcoin is still being mined. So that's certainly supply. But that's predictable supply that uh, the world adjusts for. I always say that though you can't, like Bitcoin can't be replicated. I mean, Litecoin came close, but after that, the problem is that Bitcoin was around for a year and a half, spreading around the globe at absolutely no value, at absolutely no, not much speculation. So, um, and it's not that Satoshi, you know, got the economic formula right. Oh my God, he's a genius. 21 million coins, a half-life every four years. Uh, no, the, the world adjusted to the rule set that he created. He could have created a different rule set, and the world would have adjusted to that. But this is, you can't rep replicate it, right? Because if you create something else and don't hype it up, no one is going to know it exists. And if you hype it up, um, your economics get out of whack from the first second. Uh, and that didn't happen to Bitcoin because no one expected this to actually work, and it worked. And that's how most innovation happens, and not with VC investment, with some guy in the basement, you know, putting his whole life out there uh, as a project, and it just works. Um, so the other part of supply that people don't realize is merchant adoption. And it's not so much today, but back in 2014, um, everyone wanted merchant adoption. And I was kind of fighting it. Uh, there was a tweet from PayPal saying they were looking at Bitcoin, looking to put Bitcoin into PayPal. And I thought that would be terrible. And I even debated 
saying if PayPal integrates Bitcoin, the price will probably go from $1,000 back to 10 because all of a sudden, anyone with Bitcoin will get to spend it with anything that accepts PayPal. But the merchant may not even know. PayPal immediately sells the Bitcoin on the open market uh, as market orders, creating supply pressure. You need new Bitcoiners on the other side uh, picking up that Bitcoin for utility. And uh, people are still questioning what the utility of Bitcoin is. So uh, I'm not a big fan of merchant adoption if the merchant immediately sells that Bitcoin for fiat. I don't want that merchant. If a merchant, uh, the only way I praise a merchant for accepting Bitcoin is if they hold a decent portion of that Bitcoin in Bitcoin, they try to pay their employees, maybe pay some bonuses, try to get their suppliers to accept it. You have to move Bitcoin through the supply chain. You have to create this circular economy notion. Um, otherwise, you're just creating more supply and somewhat dropping the price of Bitcoin. Uh, now we'll skip that part. Um, let's um, now let's talk about demand. Okay. Um, let's talk about demand. So demand is an interesting case. This was an article originally published in Cointelegraph from a group chat a bunch of us were in. And um, I just decided to list my reasons for why would someone use Bitcoin. And uh, it got turned into an article. I rewrote the article on Liberty Life Trail with more detail. And um, here's a list. Uh, I think everyone can see it. You guys can read it. And I wanted to talk about the use cases. Look, we have plenty of ways to pay for our daily life to pay for our cups of coffee. Cash still works, you know, credit cards, debit cards. Though I am very frustrated with debit cards here in Europe. Your chip and pin system is not ideal because in the US there's no pin. So when I stick my US credit card into a machine uh, to buy a train ticket, it's telling me enter a pin. And I'm screaming at the machine, but I don't have a pin. And um, this is insane. We're in 2013 and the two countries can't get this right. So every time I see it, as frustrating as it is for me, and I'm missing my train, I'm very happy that my money is in Bitcoin. Because this is the kind of frustration that makes people look for alternatives. Um, so my reasons, basically, things that I've already talked about, you know, governments like to control what you spend your money on. And I believe that money laundering laws are just immoral. Uh, people should be allowed to use money in any way they see fit. I think that as those of you that sat here during the ICO debate, I guess, um, I want pe people that are soliciting money from strangers, I want those people to be fully verified. I want those projects to be fully checked. Uh, I want those projects to be somehow approved with people holding them accountable. But once the project is approved, um, then anyone should be able to invest in that project and the identity of that investor should not be, can, should be kept private and not public. Um, so we start with, you know, contributing to donations to organizations like WikiLeaks. Uh, then we go to, you know, purchasing items that some jurisdictions and some governments don't like. Like governments like to have laws on voluntary transactions and i'm not a fan of that right so everything on that list are in my opinion voluntary transactions and uh, and they change based on your jurisdiction look if you're living in a in an area even like the united states where i'm from where drugs are illegal bitcoin is a use case to perhaps buy them uh, from the safety of your own living room and not have to go into the street and have you know uh, uh, quality checks, right? I mean, there's a rating system on the quality and there's a rating system on the seller. Uh, if you're in a different jurisdiction like Amsterdam or Portugal, where drugs are legal, uh, Bitcoin is not really that much of a use case, right? Because you can use your local currency. Uh, so all of these things are debatable, whether it's illegal or illegal based on where you are in the world. Uh, same thing with gambling and same thing with services. Uh, as you travel through Europe, there is red light districts everywhere. U.S. doesn't really have those. Maybe Vegas. Um, and then we get into the last two, six and seven, which are important, right? Like hiding assets from the government mostly talks about tax evasion. And again, it depends on where you are. Lots of people move to other jurisdictions. I'm a U.S. citizen. Um, I'm a New York resident. 
I pay a lot of taxes as a New York resident. Well, I used to when I had a job. Now I'm just a, you know, a guy speaking at events. But, um, uh, but um, in New York, you know, you pay the federal tax, state tax, city tax. But all I have to do is move to Puerto Rico, become a Puerto Rican resident, live on an island, and I pay zero taxes, right? So again, Bitcoin is no longer a use case if you're in certain jurisdictions. Uh, the last one, however, is the most important one, in my opinion, and that's the one I'm going to focus on uh, for the remainder of this presentation, and that is transferring value across borders. Uh, in times of stress, uh, a person would take their value and leave. Uh, they would take what's valuable to them and they would leave. And in the past, gold has filled this role very nicely. Uh, not so much today, and we will talk about why. So, um, um, again, another notion for Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin is great for the unbanked. Bitcoin is great as remittance. Uh, those use cases were never all that useful to me, and I'll explain why. Uh, oh, additional use cases, of course, crypto locker, where your computer gets you know, encrypted. And um, uh, by the way, I, I heard those guys have like the best customer service ever. And uh, because that's their model, right? I mean, if people don't believe that they will decrypt your computer, no one would pay them. And uh, the crypto locker idea has been around since the late 80s. Uh, back then, you used to have to send a money order or cash to Panama. Today, it's just Bitcoin. So um, the encrypting your computer didn't change. The method of payment did. Um, but um, the reason why I don't really see places like Africa or the Philippines as high grounds for Bitcoin's future and specifically valuation, because I am a trader, so I care about the price, is that people in those countries are on average pretty poor. And there's only so much money they can put into Bitcoin. Recently, there were articles, oh, well, one Bitcoin is $7,000 in Zimbabwe. Who in Zimbabwe can afford one Bitcoin is the question, right? Very few people. Uh, so it doesn't matter, right? The people that are buying, you know, $20, 20 euros, uh, 30 euros worth of Bitcoin, they're not the type of people that are going to drive the price up. I'm more looking at first world countries, people with money, people that worked their whole life and saved a few hundred thousand dollars for retirement. Those are the people that are nervous that they will not get that money, that they, it will be a Cyprus situation. Uh, these are the people with money that if they start putting that money into Bitcoin, Bitcoin can do serious damage from a market cap perspective. Um, and that brings me to Europe. Uh, Cyprus was just the beginning. And the first time I ever did this presentation was in February, uh, it was in Mexico, February 2015. And in that presentation, I think there was a video floating around the web somewhere, I specifically talked about the Greek banks uh, shutting down. And um, I was right about four months later, and that was another awakening of what is going to happen in these um, first world countries that are turning a little more socialist uh, than they should uh, with um, controls on money. Uh, but ever since then, I've been waiting for the Italian banks to do what the Greek banks did. And I did this presentation in Italy just last week, and the audience there were, is has been surprised for years that the Italian banks has also not done what the Greek banks have done. Uh, so it's, it's, it's imminent. It's imminent. Uh, and if it's not Italy, it's going to be Spain and Portugal and even France. Uh, Germany has been bailing out a lot of them, and we'll see what happens. You know, a lot of Germans aren't, are getting tired of bailing out the rest of Europe. Uh, people in Italy are retiring at 40 years old. I don't think anyone in Germany retires at 40 years old. And uh, I think the euro cur the common currency of the euro has lots of problems. Um, I, um, I learned some of this uh, from Martin Armstrong. I'll, I'll reference one of his slides later on. And uh, he talked about it really well, that what made the US dollar succeed when the oldest states uh, merged was the common language and a common culture. And Europe doesn't have that. Uh, the other part that helped the dollar succeed was they unified the debt, which is another thing that Europe hasn't done. And this is why I think the, the euro is going to have big problems. And if the euro a common currency breaks up, uh, there's going to be a lot of people with a lot of value that they would need to somehow save 
um, from devaluation, from confiscation, like what happened in Cyprus, uh, you know, the Greek banking shutdown. And people will just move. They'll move to somewhere else where it's better. And when you move, you got to take what's valuable to you and you got to take it with you. Uh, and some of the reasons why people move jurisdictions, I already mentioned, uh, the tax situation. So I, I was a big fan of Airbnb when I had time to plan my trips ahead of time, a little harder now. Uh, but another reason I was a big fan of Airbnb was because it was significantly cheaper and a better experience than hotels. I was using Airbnb almost from the very beginning. I really liked it. And then one day in 2015, I'm booking a room and I'm like, this feels expensive. Uh, and of course, they don't show you all the taxes. You have to click on it and then they display. And I was like thinking to myself, oh my God, what is this? I've never seen taxes before on Airbnb. Uh, and there they are. And that added about 20 to 30% to the bill. I still never understood the concept of a value added tax. Um, I don't understand what value is being added uh, to the thing that you're buying <laughs> with an additional 30% that goes to the government. Um, but all these taxes showed up on Airbnb. And one more thing happened when, uh, when I went to Airbnb. Uh, they, made me, they made me check a new terms and conditions. Um, I was about to say read, but anyone here reads the terms and conditions to some of these documents? Um, one person. Uh, do you have time to come here? <laughs> um, so this is, in, this is a two years ago now, and God knows how long it is now, but when I opened that terms and conditions, I saw the scroll bar was really, really small. And I'm like, all right, let me see this. So I have a Windows machine, I know. So I did Control A, you know, Control A, Control C, Control uh, V, paste it into Microsoft Word, and I'm like waiting, and it's like spinning. I'm like, wow. And it came back with 33,000 words and 55 pages on a Word document. Airbnb terms and conditions. It's probably doubled up by now. And I'm like, wow, this is just me renting a room when no one's in the apartment and picking up keys and dropping them off. And you compare it to some of the other historical documents. I mean, we can go back to the US Declaration of Independence. I'm a little US centric. Uh, usually, <laughs> my first time traveling through Europe doing this. Um, and the US Declaration of Independence is 1,300 words. The US Constitution, with all of its 27 amendments, we kind of sort of still follow that. Uh, but it's still only 7,800 words. Um, I loved Googling for the EU regulation on the sale of cabbage at 27,000 words. And Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper for Bitcoin was only 3,400 words. And I don't think there even was a document for the internet, right? So you have these insanely long documents and insanely long documents turn into insanely long documents for laws. Uh, this is a uh, legislation in the United States that passed several years ago. Um, anyone that, anyone want to take a guess what this is? Yes, that is Obamacare, okay? So the joke that nobody read Obamacare before they passed it is not really a joke. Um, this is a 33,000 page document, okay? Uh, and this is the law that passes. So you have these laws that are being passed that nobody understands. And kind of like the bit license in New York. So what do you do if you're a foreign entity and you want to avoid certain legislation? Well, here's an example of Volturo that converts gold into Bitcoin. And they also have a little terms and conditions that says, I confirm that I am not a resident of Iran, Syria, North Korea, or the state of New York <laughs> in order to use their service, right? Um, so, um, What's the biggest thing that um, governments are trying to eliminate and that they don't like? And the answer to that is cash. Um, I'm sure you all heard the war on cash. And it's real. It's real for real reasons. And um, I talk, I've been talking about this for a while. Uh, it's great that someone wrote a perfect article for it. And it came out of the Harvard Business Review. And um, so, there's three reasons why the government really wants to eliminate cash. So one of them is, um, and, and this was very well described in the article 
Um, maybe not the second reason, but, uh, but the first two are kind of connected. So without cash, the government can set any monetary policy that they like. Um, you really have no way of exiting the system. Uh, and specifically, that's negative interest rates. Switzerland was the first country to issue negative interest rates, which is the idea that the government wants you to spend money and they will charge you interest for keeping money at the bank. Uh, but most of you, some people don't want to spend money, they want to save money. And for them, what's the option? Well, you take the cash out. If the bank is going to use your money in any way they like, and they're going to charge you for it, you might as well hold the money in a safe. So um, with that, if there is no cash, then, no, then there's no way to exit the system. Um, Another reason uh, governments want to eliminate cash is because it eliminates uh, the run on the bank and the visual aspect of a run on the bank. Uh, when the, Greece, the Greek banks got shut down, uh, what you had was people, long queues, people lining up to withdraw their allowable 20 euros from the ATM machine. If there's no cash, there's no lines, there's no pictures, all those pictures go to the museum. The pictures from the Great Depression and the pictures from Greece in 2015 are identical, just color. One's in color, one's in black and white. But other than that, it's the same. You can't have a run on a bank. You're not going to have massive people running to the bank to withdraw money if there's no money to withdraw. But the biggest reason why is because they all think we're evading our taxes. Uh, the reason why we don't have, you know, the perfect world, the perfect peace on earth and utopia is because the government just needs more time and more money. Uh, they need your money to get it done. And uh, since we're all tax evaders, they don't have enough money to get it done. Though sometimes it's borderline true. Um, in this study, they took a look at India and they determined that India loses 30 to 44% of GDP due to its cash, cash economy and tax avoidance. Now, some people say that, well, you have to be patriotic, you have to pay your taxes. Uh, what I say is, well, you should pay the minimal amount of taxes you can legally get away with without getting into trouble. Uh, this is why you pay some accountants a lot of money, uh, because I always think that you know, people that were smart enough to earn a lot of money, honestly, <laughs> based on the previous discussion that took place here, um, these people know what to do with that money way better than the government does. And of course, I also don't like to support war and stuff like that. Uh, another thing is people are like, well, if you stop paying taxes, so you don't want the roads. And my reply to that is, you know what, how about, why can't I allocate my tax contribution like I allocate my 401k? Well, what if I want 80% of my taxes going to infrastructure and maybe 2% of my taxes going to defense or something like that, right? Uh, people should have more choices and uh, maybe Bitcoin will provide that kind of transparency. I'll, maybe I'll get to that in a second. So, um, right, I don't like to support lots of initiatives by governments, but uh, there are some functions that they do well, and those functions do need to be funded, but a lot more transparency is definitely needed. Um, so um, they also did a graphic. They analyzed how much it costs the government of some countries to keep and maintain a cash economy. And as you can see, Mexico, uh, most of the countries on the euro, and um, India and China, it's very expensive to keep the cash going. Yellow is neutral and blue is cheap. Um, so that means that stocking ATMs, you know, checking for counterfeit, printing the money, you know, uh, all that stuff is costing the government's money. Uh, and they did a graphic. So the countries all the way um, on the upper right-hand corner, the Germany, Belgium, and France, uh, these countries would benefit greatly by the elimination of cash. Uh, and um, they're most technologically ready to currently eliminate that cash. Um, you will see that like Sweden, Finland, and the UK are more technologically ready to get rid of the cash, but maintaining a cash system in those countries isn't as expensive, so they shouldn't be in such a huge rush. India is all the way on the bottom right-hand corner and all the way on the right. So India would benefit the most 
by eliminating cash. The problem is they're not very technologically ready to do so. Uh, I mean, Kenya, Philippines, uh, Egypt, and Nigeria is less technologically ready, but India has tried. They had that whole incident where they canceled currency and created other bills. And laws on cash are becoming stricter and stricter. Uh, this is an article out of France where now if you buy any, if you're a European looking to buy anything over a thousand euros worth, um, you now have to identify yourself and uh, prove where the euros came from. Here's an example out of the US, uh, one state. I'm actually having problems finding this law that passed. It says, a second-hand dealer shall not enter into any cash transactions in payment for the purchase of junk or used or second-hand property. So that means if you have a bicycle and you want to sell it for 20 euros or $20 in the US, you can't accept the $20 bill. You have to accept a check or somehow get a credit card reader. Um, so again, all these... Um, uh, laws on money coming in and governments know that well if people can't use money they'll just hide the money in valuable objects so here's an example from germany where they're passing a law or passed a law that says um uh, the law i'm reading the bottom part the law is applied retroactively nope not that part let's do that part uh, the amendment not only aims to combating illicit traffic of cultural objects in germany but at limiting ways of funding of terror organizations that are more and more financed by illegal excavations at archaeological sites, as well as illicit trades and cultural materials. Like, how many of you here really believe that terrorist organizations are funding themselves with archaeologists and becoming a traders in, you know, valuable objects? Uh, this is obviously ridiculous. This is... Uh, this is a way to identify anyone with something of value. So if you have a valuable painting on your wall, they want to know about it uh, because they want to know what you have of value. They can also tax you on it. Uh, real estate is a very good thing for governments to tax because you can't pick up your house and leave. Uh, you can't just pick up your house and leave. Um, so it's a good thing to tax because it's there. So if you have a painting on your wall, they can start taxing you 5% of the value of that painting every year, or you can sell it and somebody it's somebody else's burden. Um, and anything over 100 euros is supposed to be identified. So here's a slide from Martin Armstrong's blog, uh, one of the few economic blogs I recommend. And he talks about the population of Rome. So what happens? Um, see, the 20, uh, again, I'm gonna be US centric here for a second. The $20 trillion debt um, of the government, external $20 trillion debt. That doesn't worry me. Um, who's gonna come to America and collect? Um, nobody even knows who that's owed to. It's probably just printed by other countries. No one is collecting that. But the, hundred and t but the 120 trillion that the US government owes to its government employees or those connected to governments for government contracts, that's a problem. If that check bounces, this is how um, your society kind of collapses from within. Uh, I always say if a government check bounces, I'd rather be in Vietnam with the Vietnamese government check bouncing because no one in that country is really dependent on the government, even though it's a socialist communist country. Uh, meanwhile, in America, that's a capitalist country. If that check bounces, the cops and the firemen and the teachers, they're all gonna be on the street and it's gonna, not gonna be pretty. So what happens? Well, people just move, okay? And it happened in Rome as well. They had a huge public sector, the soldiers, and they kept promising them pensions and health care and all this other stuff. And um, eventually they kept devaluing the currency. And then, you know, the army came back, you know, wanted to take back what's theirs, stop protecting the city, and it all fell apart. And you can see that the bubble chart applies. Uh, it crashes and then it comes back and it's like, hey, everything is back to normal and then it crashes again. So the population went from one and a half million and it bottomed out at about 20,000, a thousand years later, and then it returned to normal. And as you travel around, um, what you get is uh, these customs forms. And this is why, look, gold was the gr a great tool 
to put your money into something and then you can transfer it. The problem happened with things like metal detectors, where it's now a problem. Um, it's a lot harder to move your gold uh, and customs forms now ask you how much gold you have, not all customs forms. And here are two examples from TechCrunch, uh, one before the Greek crisis that says why Greece should not switch to Bitcoin, and one right after, the Bitcoin provider Qubits aims to help Greeks move their money. So now let's talk about Bitcoin. I'm going to close out the presentation with um, talking about Bitcoin price a little bit. Uh, that is how I made my name in the space, writing articles about trading, about price, about economics. And um, I, I like to separate price analysis from time analysis. Um, finishing up, uh, we'll get to a few of your questions. And uh, I did a quick time analysis. This has already passed. Uh, in 2014, I wrote this article saying that time analysis is telling me Bitcoin will have two really key dates. One of them in the middle of June 2015. Uh, that happened to correspond to the Greek banking shutdown and I believe turned the price of Bitcoin. And the other one I, I wrote in that article from 2014, something big is going to happen on August 14th, 2017. I know you don't see the August 14th, but I followed up with other articles. And we got segued around within a week of that date. Yeah, so I was really happy talking about something big is going to happen. So I was really happy to see segued. And... Um, I'm a trader, I'm a technical trader. A lot of you may not be able to read this chart. I have other presentations and seminars, um, educating, uh, introduction to trading. And I was pretty bearish. I was looking for prices to go down. Uh, the prices actually didn't even fall as low as I expected because I wanted to see a low on my June date. Uh, but the Greek crisis came and it wasn't the low. The low came a little bit earlier. Uh, so I mistimed it a little bit. Uh, and then ever since then, oops, just skipped one. Um, well, skipped a bunch. Um, ever since then, I have been bullish. I had a channel. Some of you are traders in the room, I'm sure. We've now busted out. And uh, these were all my arrows. Um, I, well, I try to make my calls public. I usually just tweet it out. And um, I was looking for that bounce at 760. Uh, that took place, what are the dates here? Do I see dates in any of the tweets? Uh, in early January, uh, right there, uh, I was able to get that one right. Uh, my prediction for this year was only about $2,000 and then a pullback, so I was wrong. We went all the way to five. Uh, I wasn't as optimistic in the beginning of the year. Um, and some of my recent calls, I do videos all the time, even every day. Uh, I don't have time to... Wow, I don't know why it's skipping. Don't have time to get really into it, but um, just, uh, I'm just going to go through the slides. Uh, some of my calls that were public on Twitter in this presentation, uh, I called the bottom at 1,800 fairly well, and um, uh, that went up. And the most recent one on a fall from 3,000, uh, from 5,000 as we were falling, um, I tweeted out saying that you have a perfect buy zone between 2950 and 3000 and Max Kaiser replied, thank you, my limit order got filled at 2990 and now I think we're going to new highs. I'm looking for six to 7,000 in November, followed by a deeper correction, maybe back to about 5,000. But I do these almost every day, so I change my mind based on what I see on a daily basis. Thanks, guys. Oh. Uh, so thank you very much, Tone. Uh, while I'm leaving, I will start questions because we don't have to wait. Uh, I liked very much your uh, historical uh, review with uh, a lot of geopolitical facts and the fact that uh, uh, you like uh, Bitcoin uh, for the same uh, for the same reasons, uh, I think it's important. So it's decentralization is the first digital uh, property that can be stolen from you, and it's un unseizable and uncensorable. Uh, having said that, uh, where do you see the final price or market capitalization when all things settle after five or twenty years? 
uh, do you think uh, Bitcoin is going to take over the world and what percentage of money, uh, global money supply it will take? So I do think Bitcoin has a bright future, but it's still very, very speculative. Um, my, what gives me confidence in Bitcoin is the current decentralized core developer team. Uh, a couple of companies involved, Blockstream, Chenko Labs. Uh, so I support Bitcoin uh, as long as I trust in the core developers um, programming the underlying Bitcoin code. So as long as that part remains as is, I'm very confident that Bitcoin will remain stable. The most important thing to a currency or a technology is confidence. If our internet was going down like every other day, no one would be using it, right? And same thing with currency. The reason why the US dollar is so valuable around the world is because it's most trusted. Uh, other governments are less responsible with their central banks and uh, with their laws on money. So. Um, as Bitcoin continues st its stability in the protocol, um, as these forks continue to be you know, ignored, uh, Bitcoin will gain more and more confidence, and with confidence comes more and more investment. Uh, but, if the price of, but if there's too much investment and the price of Bitcoin goes up too high, you do get this bubble, and then you get this crash, and then people get discouraged. So you want Bitcoin to go up, but you don't want Bitcoin to go up too fast. Um, I really don't. Like as much as it would be awesome uh, for my personal financial gains to see Bitcoin at twenty thousand dollars each next year, it's not what I want to see. And I actually don't think it's going to happen that way. Uh, I am, uh, I am thinking about what's going to happen with the ICO bubble. The ICO bubble is coming. The old coin bubble is coming. And when it pops, will that value go into Bitcoin and drive the Bitcoin bubble? Or will that value crash Bitcoin along with it? And it's too early to say. Um, I do think that once one Bitcoin is over $10,000 consistently, it creates an awesome environment where we can start talking about Bitcoin in bits instead of Bitcoin. People have a problem thinking more than two numbers to the right of the decimal point. Um, with one Bitcoin being over $10,000, one bit is one penny, and now it starts to be something people are used to. And if a Bitcoin is a couple of, if tens of thousands of dollars, small transactions have no longer much volatility. So with the rise of the price of Bitcoin, things will become more stable and more easy to use. And do you have some, like the price on the horizon where it can get like 100,000, $1 million per Bitcoin? Again, it can. Like it just has to get there in a somewhat reasonable manner. Uh, when things go up too fast, they fall harder than they should. Yes. Uh, well, you've really started the idea with the bits. Uh, where would you see the price if people start not thinking Bitcoin, but would start thinking millibitcoins or bits? Because it's if I'm selling one unit of something, one unit is nothing. It's like one dollar, but now it's for a thousand dollars. So it changes uh, from a exactly. psychology point of view. It changes the way you look at the currency. So yes. well, well, we try. I would like to convince uh, the exchanges to switch the. Right. Well, the units. I'm, I'm going to be. I'm not trying to convince them yet. I will be once I feel Bitcoin is you know consistently above ten thousand dollars because of that penny because of that bits notation. Uh, at, at exactly 10,000, one bit is one penny. Then we can start having these discussions, in my opinion. At least that's how I'm trying to do it. Um, and um, this is one of the reasons why these old coins are so much more attractive. Uh, I mean, to me, Ripple is not even a blockchain, but people are like, hey, one Bitcoin is 4,000, but one Ripple is a fraction of a penny. I mean, they have no clue what they're buying. All they know is that it's cheaper. They can um, have many of them. Hmm? Uh, they can have many of them. Right, many like of them. most of them, right? Uh, so uh, it's OK. Uh, look, let all the speculation happen in the ICOs. I'm happy that, Bit uh, in a way, I'm happy Bitcoin isn't $20,000 today, because then I would be nervous about a crash. And then, see, nobody, 
uh, I speak at like a lot of these, um, like in Mexico, like the Anacapulco conference, and all of these gloom and doomers, and everyone's selling newsletters. They're telling you to buy gold, and the stock market is going to crash. The stock market is going to crash. The greatest investment of the last hundred years has been the stock market. People have been waiting for the stock market to crash, and their kids have already passed away of old age, and because um, the stock market adjusts for inflation. So. Um, this is where you have to be careful, because when uh, people keep telling you that the stock market is going to crash, the stock market is going to crash, um, it doesn't come. And then nobody really wants the stock market to crash, because what happened in 2008, um, your gold crashed with the stock market because everyone lost their jobs. Uh, this is why you have these bailouts, because when things get out of control, uh, you get a crash, everyone loses their job, and now er everyone's worse off. So this is why um, bubbles aren't all that great. <laughs> all right, next question. Uh, so I want to ask, uh, what's your take on the centralization of Bitcoin? I mean, from the point of uh, mining, from the point of uh, developers, it can get more centralized in the future, um, and also in the point of a uh, couple of addresses owning like uh, majority of Bitcoin. Sure. I actually don't see uh, the only centralization in development that I see is these hard fork attempts. Like Bcash is a centralized development effort by the miners themselves. Even uh, this new one that may or may not come in November is a complete centralization effort. And they're centralized efforts by incompetent developers. Because if they were competent, they would still be programming uh, for core, even anonymously. So um, Bitcoin development is actually pretty decentralized, and I believe is getting more decentralized. As far as mining goes, it doesn't bother me either because, look, um, we don't know if um, uh, what's going to happen with mining. I mean, China is already cracking down on a lot of things. They can crack down on mining. Uh, there's mining in China because electricity is cheap and the manufacturing is cheap. That's not always going to stay that way. And people are mining around the world. I mean, I'm mining at, at, at my place for mostly, I mean, I'm not profitable just to help decentralize the network. And I think more and more people will do it. Uh, my hope for to really help decentralizing mining, look, we're all used to paying for things we don't use. I mean, I've been traveling for two months. You know, I still have like internet bills at home. I'm not using them. Um, God knows the last time I went to a gym, you know, you're still paying for a gym membership. Um, so. Uh, that, that's what I see happening. Like my best example is this: suppose a company like Netflix wanted to enter a market they couldn't enter before, like Africa, because of rampant credit card fraud. It's really hard for Netflix to do that, but they can pop up a Bitcoin QR code on the screen, and people can pay for a movie. People can pay for for a show. If you have these big companies that are now making millions and millions of dollars by utilizing Bitcoin, it would be to their advantage by spending a percentage of that money on a mining farm just to help decentralize the network to make sure that their revenue uh, stays where it is thanks to a decentralized currency. Next. Um, I have a question about the use cases that you had. You had certain use cases, and I'm wondering if Bitcoin is a use case for a, or a country like Venezuela, for example, where they have high inflation. I mean, Bitcoin has high volatility, but it, on the other hand, it may make sense for people to use bits, Bitcoins. And the, the second use case I see is if people uh, use portfolio the theory to have something that doesn't correlate with other things. And then it makes sense to have like a share of your portfolio in Bitcoins and hold it there. Sure, right. Uh, well, Venezuela has a beautiful case for Bitcoin. People are using Bitcoin to buy food from Amazon and it gets shipped from Miami, right? So because, I mean, that's the thing, right? That's buying things the government doesn't want you to buy. And in Venezuela, there's even limits on how much food you can buy. Uh, but with Bitcoin, you have no limit on how much food you can buy. And you can buy food through Amazon from the States with Bitcoin through a middleman. I mean, Amazon doesn't accept Bitcoin, but there are middlemen. They'll take your Bitcoin. They'll buy you whatever you want. They'll even give you a discount. Uh, and then you just get it shipped. Uh, as for the portfolio management, well, Bitcoin, you're right. It, it's a good asset that's somewhat uncorrelated to a lot of the things that you're holding. 
but that's more of an investment, right? That's not really a use case. That's more of a speculative investment, but it does help your to decentralize your portfolio in a way. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Bitcoin is a way in, of investing in the gray market, right? I mean, if, uh, if it's true that the gray market is like 20, 25% of the global economy, then holding Bitcoin as the currency of the gray market is in a way diversifying your portfolio to exposure to the gray market. So next question, please uh, think about your question carefully because we have five minutes left. Um, you said in one of your videos that uh, if Bitcoin forks, it will lose its property as a store of value. And clearly that has already happened. So did you change your mind on that? Or? Well, I, I, if I said it that way, I was clearly incorrect. It's not that it forks. Is if another alternative to Bitcoin uh, becomes a better Bitcoin, then there is no store of value in cryptocurrencies. Right. Because right now, a lot of us are holding all of our value in Bitcoin. And it's not like go it, look, it's not like switching browsers from Mozilla to uh, Chrome. It's not like switching social networks from uh, MySpace to Facebook to whatever. Maybe it will come next. Uh, it's not like switching text messenger apps Do it all the time. But when you have all of your valuables in Bitcoin, and most people do, um, and something else becomes better than Bitcoin, why on earth would you trust it as a store of value? Because you know another one can overtake it, right? So I believe that the crypto space only has one chance to get the store of value property correct, and that's Bitcoin. Because I know I will never trust any other crypto. If Bitcoin fails, um, sure, whatever comes along Maybe it's Litecoin, maybe it's whatever, right? Whatever is the next best thing, I'll gladly use it as a transactional currency, but I will never use it as a store of value. Maybe I'll go to gold, but I'll probably go to the S&P 500. I'll put all my money in the stock market because that historically goes up with inflation. Um, or I'll come up with something else. But um, right now, I'm using Bitcoin as a store of value. And um, if that fails, why on earth would I trust another crypto for that? So uh, you are clearly a Bitcoin maximalist, right? Sure. Okay, but uh, still Bitcoin uh, has some use cases, but uh, there may be another cryptocurrency with different use cases because it works differently. Let's say it's, it may be inflationary or it can have some other properties. So don't you think uh, at least a couple of cryptocurrencies uh, can work together in a global scale? I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, there is some... Um, Long-term use cases, well, let's say Bitcoin is only divisible by 100 million. What happens when one Satoshi needs to be divisible? We have a bit of a technological problem doing that. But on a lightning channel, you could subdivide one Satoshi. Um, also, if any of these altcoins have a feature that is useful, a Bitcoin will incorporate that feature because otherwise they would just give up market share. But you also have to remember the smartest people are programming for Bitcoin. They're not programming for these altcoins. The smartest people are programming for Bitcoin. And most of the time, they tell these other the people come in and say, hey, Bitcoin needs this feature. And like a group of smart developers, data scientists look at it and they say, no, this is a bad idea. Here, this, this, and this. And the person says, no, you're wrong. I'm going to go and start Zcash. You know, no, you're wrong. I'm going to go and start something else. Um, the same thing happened in the beginning. The Satoshi quote, um, if you don't get it, uh, I, don't, I no longer have the time to explain it to you. That famous quote was to a guy who created proof of stake. Um, so, uh, like, you have these situations where you think it's better. That's because, like, somebody smarter told you it's not better, and you went out and tried to convince the world that it was, and they're all going to end up failing, in my opinion. Uh, so, and they're all competing for the same electricity. Keep that in mind, right? To me, the only thing, if it's not proof of work, it's not a blockchain. Call it whatever you want, but it's not a blockchain. It has to be proof of work. And all the proof of work blockchains are still competing for investment in hardware, and the electricity cost. And most of the people mining these altcoins are only mining them to get their hands on Bitcoin. Uh, so this is 
It's not that I'm a Bitcoin maximalist and I don't like anything else. It's just that I haven't seen anything else worth paying attention to. And that's why I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, so because we have uh, no other question, I will give you the last one. And it will be about near future of Bitcoin. What do you think about 2x? How the scenario will play out? Will we split? Uh, and uh, what will be what it will do to the price? Um, I believe that the 2x hard fork will probably happen only because there are either one developer or two developers can't be that much more than them. Uh, they've spent you know a bunch of time pushing it and looking for it, and they're gonna want to do it. Uh, kind of like the military, you know, if the, the military is developing a bunch of weapons, they don't really want them to sit there and rust. Sooner or later, they're going to want to use them. Uh, so um, I do think the 2x hard fork will happen. I think it would, would be even less relevant than the previous hard fork. Uh, and more and more companies will ignore it uh, because it's just, it doesn't make sense. Uh, there's nobody there. There's nobody there that knows what they're doing as far as programming it. Um, uh, right now, like the, all the rules of open source development are being thrown out the window uh, to program this 2x hard fork code. And the real developers, the core developers, now have to waste their valuable time in you know, uh, building you know, the next core client that ignores those other nodes instead of working on something like fungibility, like lightning, like all of these people that are hard forking, keep accusing the core developers that they're too slow. Bitcoin isn't innovating and all that stuff. But that's because half their time is spent fighting those people instead of working, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, so I am completely against these hard fork efforts, but I'm looking forward to this next hard fork. Because I think the two, the Bcash and the 2x hard fork, they're just going to fight each other for hash rate, and they'll leave us alone. So that's, they, 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 I think they'll fight each other more than they'll bother Bitcoin. So I'm okay with it. So thank you very much, Tone, for uh, your presentation. Thank you.